Greetings, everyone. Welcome to GSI Talk. And today we have with us Jeffrey Fernandez, who is a PhD candidate at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at Billa Institute of Technology and Science at Pilani campus. His doctoral research examines the use of culture, mythology, and folklore in video games. And today he's going to talk about the topic, counter hegemonic representations of Japanese culture icons in Sekiro and in video games in general. So please welcome Mr. Jeffrey Fernandez and over to you, Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Rico. And hello all. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, how Japanese culture icons, specifically ninja and samurai, are talked upon in the context of uh, video games and how there exists a uh, oriental framework in the discussion of these characters in pop culture and how Sekiro is a standout in the industry in this regard as it tries to present counter hegemonic representations and try to break away from this orientalist framework. So to begin, first we need to talk about what is orientalism. As defined by Edward Said, uh, it can be taken as a Western style for dominating, restructuring and having authority over the Orient. To put it very simply, uh, what happens is that the West takes up the voice or basically takes up the opportunity to talk about the East without giving the East a chance to talk for itself. And hence any presumptions or any perceptions that the West makes then becomes, uh, that becomes the dominant uh, viewpoint basically for talking about, for any discourse upon the East. Uh, furthermore, Wagena in his article, Wacky Japan, A New Face of Orientalism, says that embedded in the framework of Orientalism is an uneven power balance where the supposedly superior West creates its identity for the inferior other without allowing it for speak for, to speak for itself. So this, uh, uh, sort of culture and sort of uh, adds uh, its own interpretations to that which is somewhat problematic. Moving on to the Oriental discourses of Japan. Uh, uh, one second. Uh, this, uh, this has been worked upon extensively by even game scholars like uh, Mia Consalvo, uh, who talks about how the Japanese discourse has come around uh, into the Western context. Uh, she stated that Japan became central to the Oriental discourse around 1850s when it entered its isolationist policies. And then lots of texts from, uh, uh, lots of Japanese texts sort of arrived in the Western context and uh, introduced the West to many concepts that were inherent to Japan. That in turn has uh, led the Western imagination uh, to like focus on certain aspects of Japan. As Wagner again states, in general, the Western imagination of Japan focused on two approaches that the country could be characterized either in the terms of its aesthetic, uh, aesthetic uh, elegant qualities or through its martial culture. Hence keywords like geisha, kimono, tea ceremony, woodblock prints, and zen are pitted against violent terms such as kamikaze, ninja, and samurai. And this weird ambiguity that uh, presents between uh, these kind of two terms, it, it, mis it made Japan more mysterious and it's more exotic. Uh, apart from that, Again, we come back to Sayed's concept that such an understanding then would make the Orient an imagined construction of the West and not an actual space. As in, this is an imaginary space with uh, not true uh, interpretations of a said culture. So uh, that in itself becomes problematic. And this is reiterated when Chris uh, Goto Jones talks about uh, the same concept in his article, playing with being in digital Asia, gimmick orientalism and the virtual dojo. That he states that Jap Japanese-ness is not a category controlled by Japan, but rather by an idea of Japan. And this idea of Japan appears to be sustained and propagated by global capitalism rather than any national entity. Uh, I will talk upon uh, this global capitalism aspect a little further on uh, when I talk discuss about the orientalist frameworks present in the marketing of games. Uh, but then we move on uh, to other statements 
uh, by some prominent uh, authors. Like Holborn, for example, states that the adoption and exoticization of Jap the Japanese aesthetic is mostly ignored in the favor of highlighting Japan's adoption, imitation, and reinterpretation of Western ideologies and technology, making Japan as a passive receiver and a space to be reinvented by the West. Uh, I think that is very prominent in uh, how Japanese culture is viewed in pop culture as in how they talk, uh, how they are more, they are received better when they talk more about how the Western concepts are highlighted in Japanese forms of media rather than the opposite. And apart from that, uh, another from, uh, I think pretty prominent text would be by Lisa Nakamura, where she talks uh, about how the uh, orientalized male persona, most probably uh, in uh, text-based games around the 1990s, how when represented uh, in this way that the orientalized male persona with the sword confirms the idea that an orient, the orient uh, is a potent, antique, exotic, and uh, anachronistic. Uh, uh, this is also, uh, and, and in fact, it would be pretty rude of me not to mention this, but uh, this is also uh, sort of deteriorated uh, in the works by so Sovik Mukherjee, who, ta who talks about this exact factor in his paper playing the subaltern. Uh, and how this, he, he further goes on to talk about how this uh, it applies to the Indian context. But over in this uh, presentation, I would be focusing specifically on how this uh, applies to Japan. So moving on, I would like to now give you uh, all you all a brief history of how the myth of the ninja has been exoticized in modern pop culture. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of you must be familiar with the concept of ninja being something that uh, people who wear like black dresses and only like the eyes are visible, they're completely cloaked. But was that really the case? Uh, when we look back to some of the academic works that have been done by experts such as Stephen Turnbull, who can be considered as one of the pioneers of the study of this region, uh, this uh, sorry area. He says that although today's common notion is that the ninja wore a black outfit and a black, uh, it's not true because the black uh, one is rather conspicuous because its outline becomes apparent on the night, which is not dark. In reality, the ninja wore working clothes dyed navy blue worn by farmers. So basically what he wants to say is that uh, since ninja, uh, in fact, the whole concept of a ninja is has been morphed quite a lot, which I'll be talking about a little like uh, after this, uh, after this slide. Uh, so the common misconception is that ninja is supposed to be, say, a uh, part of a like group of assassins or some mythical being, which might have, a, they might have supernatural powers. That's the kind of impression that pop culture gives to people. But that would be very wrong because basically nin the job of a ninja was to be a spy for their kingdom. And as spies, uh, it would make sense that they wear the clothing of the common person for that they do not stand out. As in such case, they used to wear clothings that were mostly worn by farmers. And uh, uh, it was very common for people, uh, even farmers in that era to carry swords around with them for protection from bandits. So it would not be out of place for a ninja or, or someone dressed up like a farmer to be carrying a sword. This uh, image of a black wearing ninja, it, it has a very interesting origin actually, because in Kabuki, that is a Japanese theater art form, uh, the traditional, uh, the stage hands, basically, the people who used to assist uh, with, uh, like, say, moving objects or like trying to imitate action, these uh, these stage hands used to wear black so that they are not visible on the stage, and they were supposed to, like you were supposed to assume that they are not present. And uh, but sometimes when uh, these kind of plays wanted to depict how nin ninja were present. Uh, uh, sorry, these, uh, these plays wanted to depict how uh, the presence of ninja, for example, and if supernatural activities, uh, according to their mythology, were taking place as in some uh, invisible object moving or something like that. These stagehands themselves would sometimes get into, the, uh, get into the action of the play, giving people the impression that, oh, okay, they, uh, they are ninja and they are part of this. So that black uh, dress, that cloak, started being uh, you know, connected to the ninja in this way. And then let's move on to how this has been adopted by the West. Uh, so the first and foremost thing would be that uh, 
the there was a series of eight films made in Japan called as Shinobi no Mono that was around 1962. And they were adopted from the novel of the same name. And the, it was in this that the these boundaries of what are popular in the modern myth of the ninja, they were set around uh, in that movie. And that movie greatly, along with movies of, say, Kurosawa, very uh, like greatly influenced how the Western uh, media forms or how the Western uh, thought captured uh, or like trying to transmit these topics to the West, uh, Western context. The uh, Western perception of the ninja myth was majorly influenced by the representations, their representations in, the, uh, in Western films in the 1970s and 80s. As I said earlier, like uh, the Western films were kind of influenced by Shinobi no Mono and Hence, uh, I think the one that really set, set the tone would have been uh, James Bond movie, as shown here in the pictures, the movie called You Only Live Twice. What's interesting is that Ian Fleming uh, did write the novel, keeping ninjas in mind, and it was a really wacky kind of concept where Bond ends up in Japan, loses his memory, and starts learning maybe ninja techniques, and there's it's really wacky actually. And then he ends up thinking he's Japanese by the end of it. That was how the book was. But uh, another interesting fact is that Roald Dahl, as many of you familiar with literature, like you know him, he ended up screenwriting the plot for the movie. And in that, he completely changed up the form and include, included even way more wackier stuff. A few examples of that would be visible in the poster that I've put up here. If you look at the first one, we can clearly see that it's a fetishization of like Asian women and the whole bath culture that's present in Japan. Uh, the second one, we can clearly see that he's sort of wall walking, which is another myth that's associated with ninja, as in how they could walk on walls and add supernatural powers. And apart from that, of course, we can see all the tropes that would have appealed greatly to the US in the olden days, like communist missiles, etc., etc. And the third, finally, uh, poster, we can see that as a reference to kamikaze pilots that were very popular in the World War II, that were very specifically attributed to Japan. So we can see there's this sort of orientalist imagery in these kind of uh, pictures. But again, back to the point, that was the first time the myth of the uh, ninjas were basically portrayed in uh, Western media or Western movies. And then it just kept, uh, people just kept on building upon that. For example, uh, then we can look at uh, movies by Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris, for example, how they started incorporating, you know, ninjas and other kind of martial arts, basically which led to the association of ninja being like uh, ninja movies, for example, being movies that showed people practicing martial arts. And then as time kept on going, uh, that, that myth then changed to a ninja being someone who's proficient in martial arts. I means preferably they would be Asian or with an Asian background. And uh, then that interpretation later on changed to people means from uh, the own con their own continent, European continent or the American continent, specifically because this trope was more popular in uh, ho Hollywood. For white people being trained by uh, Asian uh, people of Asian descent or like uh, who are experts in martial art, and that then became the new trend of the ninja movies. Most prominent examples, which I think would be relevant even today, thanks to Netflix, would be uh, the Karate Kid, for example. Uh, how a white person is being taught the ancient techniques of like very oriented discourse on uh, martial arts and how they apply to their own lives. Which again brings us to the point that the concept of a ninja was already presented as a cultural mashup of Eastern concepts. Because when these concepts were uh, say imported to America, they were already a mashup of like many multiple things, multiple misconceptions as well as myths. So uh, since it was such a, it's already such a mashup, it became very easy for the West to put their own ideas and thoughts into the concept of a ninja, which is again visible in uh, this poster of the movie called The Black Ninja. 
another interesting fact about this thing would be that uh, this also occurred during the time when black exploitation was really popular. Black exploitation is basically a sort of movement where a lot of media was targeted specifically at the black audience to uh, popularize their concerns or to sort of uh, uh, ca cash on their concerns uh, regarding their position in society and how they are treated, for example. Uh, one of the major themes of black exploitation movies or media would be that uh, the protagonists would be outsiders to a society where they do not fall into the system nor are they provided uh, rights by the system and how as an outsider they have to take justice into their own hands. This could very easily, uh, it was very compatible with the concept of a ninja being that ninjas also sometimes were considered as like say of Asian descent and hence an outsider to a community in America, especially considering how the Japanese were treated after the World War II in America, how uh, there were many, uh, how the, basically the American populace had a problem with them due to their actions in the World War II. So, Again, this made it very easy for the black exploitation media and ninja media to be uh, merged together to form films, which are like uh, depicted in the poster. This again can be very problematic. So this was a brief history of uh, how uh, the ninja myth was evolved in pop culture. And if I have to also talk about how uh, say this kind of uh, exoticization or intellectualist discourse is present in video games. Again, I would urge you all to refer to Shavik Mukherjee for his work. Then there's Emil Hama and a uh, few other scholars who talk about this. Uh, uh, Shavik Mukherjee specifically talks about this in the Indian context. But over here in this presentation, I would like to talk about how it's uh, present in the Japanese context because here, there is a special element called self-orientalism that takes place. So what is self-orientalism? If you look at uh, Tucker's article, The Orientalist Perspective, Cultural Imperialism, Imperialism in Gaming, he says that essentially Orientalism acts as a two-way relationship in which the West consumes a fetishized version of the East and in which the East internalizes that fetishization and markets it to the West. Because the Orientalist subject is founded on the exploitation of the otherness, the Oriental, uh, Oriental subject in turn allows an auto-exoticizing Japan to use cultural tropes and stereotype icons to market itself to a Western audience. What this basically means is that Japan has a, uh, Japan in itself is a very powerful gaming industry uh, because uh, in fact, apart from America, the roots of like how gaming has grown as an industry also began in Japan. And, but what's surprising here is that when even despite having such a uh, powerful uh, say presence in the gaming industry, Japan has internalized uh, these uh, conceptions that the West has about them and ends up uh, incorporating those into its own narratives to try to market it to say a bigger audience that would be say the overseas market, et cetera. And hence they end up creating their own sort of orientalism and stereotyping their own icons in such a way. Apart from that, Tucker also states that when such a consumer, when uh, such a consumer, that would be say the Western consumer, comes across the cross-cultural concepts found in Japanese video games, these these cultural nuances are often ridiculed and written off as being eccentric. More often than not, it is mainly due to a Japanese gaming ideal being repackaged to serve the international market. This would be very popular, I think, even in the Indian context for those who are familiar with Japanese game shows such as Takeshi's Castle, which used to come on earlier. Uh, I remember a lot of people uh, considering that wacky in nature because nothing made sense. Now, uh, again, that's this point which state that it would be some kind of cultural ideal that did not translate properly. Further examples of that are, say, also uh, the children's game called, I think, Kancho, which is a very playful game in Japanese culture, but would definitely be classed as sexual assault in Western cultures. So it's a misinterpretation of facts uh, that can cause different understandings of certain concepts, which in a turn uh, becomes problematic as it forms more orientalism in nature. A few examples of how this self-orientalism takes place in Japanese video games. Uh, games like Neo and Final Fantasy have this. I can very specifically talk about Neo because uh, its main character is 
a person called William, who's supposed to be from British origin, who enters up in the uh, in the Iasu dynasty, basically following some uh, culprit from uh, Britain, and then the whole story turns around to him helping the Japanese uh, in their uh, the Iasu dynasty, specifically in their invasion and in their uh, endeavors, basically in Japan. So it, fo- it shifts the focus from inherent Japanese cultures and in the in- inherent Japanese story to a white person coming to the East and solving their problems for them. Hence, that becomes extremely problematic. Apart from that, there are video games uh, such as the o- Onimusha and Tenchu series, which capitalize on the uh, exoticized ninja myth of them being able to use supernatural abilities, elemental abilities, and uh, they use those mechanics in their games to sell it to the Western markets. But now uh, we move on to Sekiro. And Sekiro, again, I would like to point out is a very uh, unique game in this matter because it does take the effort to try to set the tone again correctly and depict uh, Shinobi, that would be the Japanese term for ninja in a way that's more historically accurate. So a brief synopsis of the plot of Sekiro. Uh, The game starts with an orphan being adopted by a very prominent shinobi called Owl. And this was during a time when there was a lot of bloodshed uh, that was uh, uh, put upon uh, the Japanese continent by a warlord named Ishinashina. So Owl, this shinobi, takes, takes up this young orphan and names him Wolf. Uh, whose Japanese translation or name would be Okami. He adopts this uh, orphan and teaches him the techniques and the sh- his shinobi way. And then uh, Wolf becomes a prominent shinobi in his own right and in a part of the air, Lord Kuro. Now Kuro uh, plays a very important Important part Lord, as he is blessed with the powers of a dinner to resurrect after death. And thus his power is sought out by uh, the Ashina. Uh, hence, the captain of uh, the Ashina clan attempts to capture Kuro, which leads to a cla- uh, which leads to this clash between Wolf. That's Okami and the captain. And uh, in the process of the battle, Wolf loses his arm. Distraught and uh, his uh, lord is kidnapped by the captain. Distraught by his failure, he is then given again a second chance when he meets a mysterious sculpt- uh, sculptor who gives him a prosthetic arm as a replacement. And uh, then, uh, which is also has a lot of weapons in them. And uh, reinvigorated by uh, this, uh, Wolf tries to recapture his lord from the clutches of the Ashina. And in the process, he goes through like a pretty uh, fant- uh, f- fantasy based, uh, say, approach to the Sengoku period of Japan, where the landscapes are filled with mythical creatures uh, to kind of regain his lord back. But what I would like to point out here is that even if there are mythical creatures and fantastical creatures present in this, they are inherently J- Japanese in nature and they're very much in line with the Japanese folk culture that's present. So do not be an orient- orientalized view of, say, such a... Uh, this is going to be considered as an orientalized depiction as such. Now, very specifically, moving on to how uh, Sekiro addresses these pop culture myths and problematic depictions of ninja. So uh, the first thing I would like to say is that uh, a lot of these games uh, that depict ninja, what they get wrong is that they consider uh, ninja a specific uh, type of warrior where they uh, where they basically fight with techniques called ninjutsu. And ninjutsu is such a orientalized concept in the Western context, as again, I pointed out earlier, how they consider to have supernatural powers as they can breathe on fire, walk on walls, walk on water, etc. While in reality, if, if you are supposed to put uh, the ninja term to like an actual discussion it, in the Japanese context, it can be seen as a job and a job that is basically a part uh, of 
the samurai class. Basically, ninjutsu were distraction techniques or specific techniques that were meant for spying. As the job of a ninja usually was spying. Uh, so, uh, and it's it might be that uh, these they might have martial skills such as sword fighting, but that was not nece a necessity in uh, uh, their job. So, uh, this is the first thing that Sekiro gets right as it portrays. Uh, wolf as a hybrid between a shinobi and a samurai, where he has the sword fighting skills, but also has the ninjutsu techniques, which are basically used for, uh, again, as I st stated earlier, distractions or to create uh, or to like spy on people. So the first myth that this game addresses, the fact that, which uh, is that ninja were fictional characters. Now, again, in those Western interpretation and Western movies, ninjas were shown as this shadowy characters or like people who would just appear anyway and never uh, could they could never pin down whether they have a past whether they're real or not the reality was that ninja were very real character uh, cultural icons and they were present uh, in the warring states period of japan but they faded into obscurity during the meiji restoration period as due to changes in warfare their their what uh, advantages they offered were no longer required Hence, that job basically faded into oblivion. Sekiro uh, depicts this, uh, I mean, the, the setting of the game in Sekiro is placed basically in the warring stage Japan. So it's not really far off. In fact, it's very plausible to have a ninja protagonist and that makes it accurate to the setting. The second myth would be that ninjas were expert warriors. A lot of these movies would uh, basically, uh, the Western movies would show as ninjas infallible. In fact, even in pop cultural representations of ninja, they are shown as to be extremely skilled warriors and uh, where they, they could basically turn the tide in a war, where even say a single ninja could take on an army on, its, on itself. But that is not correct because in reality, while the historical ninja were experts in espionage, infiltration, guerrilla warfare, propaganda and arson, uh, they uh, were not necessarily trained in combat, as I stated earlier, because their major job was spying. Now to have a specialization in combat is definitely advantageous and plausible, but that was never considered a criteria to be a ninja. And in Sakiro, as I stated earlier, uh, they take this approach where uh, Okami or Wolf is basically a hybrid between a samurai and a shinobi. So, uh, in the game, while Okami works alone and is a capable warrior, he can still die quickly. And those familiar with the game uh, would be, know what I'm talking about because the combat in the game is like extremely hard. Uh, the game basically works on a function of deflection and uh, timing. It's a rhythmic based game. And if you miss even one prompt or like one action, you can be punished pretty brutally. So that also, you know, uh, ties into this concept of that uh, even one mistake can cause death, which gives us very, uh, which basically highlights the mortality of the shinobi. So that goes very well uh, in how, uh, so this mechanic in Sekiro goes very well with how the act actually was in, in the real life of the ninja. But uh, the advantage that the ninja have over say a common samurai is that they have several op options at their disposal. And it's up to say the player in Sekiro to use this uh, multiple, uh, the whole arsenal that's pre uh, presented to the player in creative ways to get around either through stealth or through other mechanics, uh, basically to clear that level. Uh, so uh, what it tries to portray is that uh, the Shinobi were not all powerful or like invincible uh, warriors, but they were cunning warriors. Hence, they, they could use their skills to uh, face the challenges that they would uh, go through. And this is, uh, again, Sekiro does a very good job of trying to highlight this fact. The third myth that's very, again, very popular in pop culture representations is whether samurai and ninja are sworn enemies. Like, there are a ton of movies around the 1990s and 2000s thousands that uh, and are basically plots for the whole entire in uh, the Japanese uh, context and uh, ninja is a profession 
that's mostly practiced in the samurai class this would mean mean, mean basically that uh, the samurai were trained in the arts of ninjutsu which again were uh, spying tactics or distraction tactics so this just becomes an additional uh, uh, battle strategy for the samurai most ninja were indeed samurai and these two don't contradict each other and ninja samurai were not uncommon specifically in the sengoku period in which sekiro is set how the game takes approaches this is that as i mentioned earlier wolf is a hybrid between a samurai and a shinobi in the sense that he is a warrior uh, trained in shinobi techniques but yet he is the retainer of the young lord kuro which makes him and just because him being a protector of a lord makes him a samurai apart from that uh, in the clash between uh, the captain of ashina and wolf for the fate of young lord kuro it it can it, it's not seen as a rivalry between a samurai and a ninja but mo- mostly a battle that determines where uh, the fate of the young lord how where he would end up or what would happen to him so those are some of the really realistic uh, depictions of how like the uh, it's basically how ninjas were in that period and now moving on to game mechanics how the game mechanics try to highlight these facts a fair warning to those who have issues with go because that's how the game is but as you can see in the gif over here stealth is a very important aspect in the game which makes approaching battles much easier so in the game you are given multiple options as to how you want to slip past enemies in dangerous areas and escape out of dire situations so uh, that is a very realistic factor uh, which is not usually followed in pop culture uh, tropes because while stealth use is definitely an aspect uh, and infiltration is definitely shown in pop culture in battles uh, the whole fights of ninjas is about throwing shuriken and you know like uh, uh, kunai and those kind of weapons and basically it's very heads on but that was not never the purpose of a shinobi because the whole concept of them was to be stealthy and to play as this option it's a more realistic depiction than the other uh, other pop cultural forms apart from that eavesdropping or listening into conversations is also another mechanic that uh, sekiro adapts very well into the game because that in itself first is a important mechanic because it might reveal the uh, say enemy weaknesses to a player while overhearing soldiers talking about say that uh, boss boss character or uh, even uh, apart from that sekiro uh, in this game eavesdropping gives players an opportunity to learn about the lore of the game the world uh, the world building or like what uh, other specific information of like how to find treasures in the game that's the kind of information that's available through eavesdropping so this ties in very well with the primary job function of a you know be that is to get the information and that is what actually made them very deadly because before they get caught in battle they knew the enemy weaknesses so by implementing this mechanic uh, provide a more accurate uh, depiction of shinobi for what they were then another interesting uh, aspect in the game mechanics is deflections uh, i am sure a lot of you might be very familiar with sword battles in pop culture where it's just two people slamming swords against each other for no apparent reason just to give them an opportunity to have a long philosophical discussion that's a trope that's common in a lot of animes and other, other pop culture depictions so uh, that's never the purpose in a battle uh, because uh, it's it's counterintuitive in fact when uh, sword fighting does take place the aim is to deflect the blow of a opponent to give a opening uh, to basically uh, go for a critical or a fatal shot so that's what uh, the game mechanics in sekiro try to replicate because they have a whole system of deflections and posture where upon uh, trying to affect the enemy posture leads an opening once the posture meter goes down that gives wolf basically an opening to kind of uh, hit a fatal shot that's called as a death blow uh, which uh, would uh, instantly one shot an enemy basically the whole health bar goes down so this is how they uh, through the gif we can see the how they've tried to implement that and uh, it was also important to note that 
the, the cues for the deflection, for example, are based on very loud, loud noises of clashing of sorts, which gives the player the sense of timing to when to click the buttons to be able to clear, uh, create that opportunity. And the character is required to expend the least amount of energy possible to deflect the moves made. Because uh, as I also mentioned earlier, if you do not follow the cues properly and expend too much energy, then you too as a character are open to the same kind of blows that you are trying to inflict on, on the enemy. And the game punishes them very cruelly. So that in itself gives you the illusion that a mastery is needed for such a skill, which again uh, highlights the capability of Shinobi as in the original form, in the original historical form. And as I mentioned earlier, death blows. As we can see in the GIF uh, shortly, apart from all these deflections, when the uh, prompt or the red uh, button basically appears, uh, that's when Wolf gets the chance to hit a fatal shot, which instantly depletes the whole enemy's health bar. Now, there's a misconception again that can cut through anything. As we can clearly see that and swords would definitely have problems cutting through such kind of heavy armor. So how uh, Sekiro tackles this is that when it, the, the uh, fatal shot or the death blow is triggered of the enemy, as in the gaps between the armor through the throat and such areas, which, uh, which when compared to the real world tactics make a lot of sense apart from like as compared to pop cultural tropes. So that is another way how Sekiro tries to, you know, uh, subvert this kind of misconception and try to bring more realistic depictions. So with that, I reached the conclusion of this presentation that From Software have crafted uh, an impressive interpretation of Samurai and Shinobi that is subversively consistent and overall faithful to the historical versions. Second, the developers have also attempted to challenge the misconceptions that audiences have brought about these two figureheads in Japanese history, that is Shinobi and Samurai. And hence, Sekiro becomes a leading example of his kind, which explores the possibility of a non-orientalist depiction of the uh, Ghost of Tsushima also has done this. But what uh, Sekiro has over Ghost of Tsushima is that one, it's created by Japanese developers themselves, and hence they get they do not face the same kind of criticisms that Tsushima gets about cultural appropriation. Second, I would like to also state that while I talked about Japanese cultural icons, if you look at the overall story, we can consider it as an intertextual narrative of Japanese folklore, which and it's not spoon fed to the audience as uh, other cultural sort of based games are the, like how the culture and other uh, cultural based games are portrayed to the audience. Over here in this game, if you have to figure out the significance of the folklore and how they relate to the story, uh, the game encourages you, encourages you basically to do your own research, to learn about Japanese culture in this way. So it then serves as a very good repository of how to learn Japanese culture. And with that, I would end my presentation and keeping in true form with how Sekiro is as a, as a game, how, it, how I personally feel it should have been called Sekiro Shadows Die a thousand times because the combat is super frustrating and the game is very tough. I would like to end the presentation in true Sekiro fashion uh, with this GIF. Thank you, Jeffrey. That was a wonderful presentation. And to the audience, if you want to ask any question regarding what regarding Jeffrey's talk in general, you can post it in the comment section. We will answer your questions and doubts. So you can post your comments in the comment section, ask any question. So does anyone have any questions? Yeah, uh, I, yeah, Lakshmi, sorry. 
Yeah, let's make it. No, no, you can go ahead. No, you can go ahead. No, no, no. Mine is more generic. So please. Good, good. I know. I'm just trying to frame a couple of things before I speak. So go ahead. (laughs) All right. So I wonder, first of all, wonderful talk, Jeffrey. It was very, very informative. I was just wondering, uh, this ninja, I was really uh, fascinated by this ninja uh, samurai conversation. And I was thinking that because we are not Japanese, right? So we often, by we, I mean general public, we often, uh, when we when it comes to ninja, karate, uh, martial arts, we often confuse these, especially ninjas, with Chinese culture as well, right? Uh, can you, like, do you, yes. do you have any opinion on that? Like this, like this outsider's confusion about Japanese culture, this orientalist culture. Well, ja- uh, culture, I mean. ja- like orientalist culture would basically apply to all of Asia, in fact. Okay. And this is the orientalist uh, framework at play that would say, you know, make you confuse Chinese with Japanese, right? Where martial arts are like all part of this, uh, uh, you know, huge orientalist discourse. The very fact that, say, someone would confuse that uh, karate, for example, is a very specific Japanese art form, uh, martial form, sorry. And to confuse that with Chinese is the Orientalist discourse at play. What uh, Sekiro as a game does is very specifically choose a very inherently uh, cultural icon, Japanese cultural icon in the ninja. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's very interesting to note that the word ninja itself is a mixture of like Japanese, uh, sorry, Chinese symbols, the symbols nin and sha, which then is a made up word. It's a made up word and uh, it's then interpretation has due to self-orientalism, in fact, reached the Japanese context too, where they refer to the historical warrior as shinobi and the pop culture representation as ninja, which is, again, a word of Chinese origin. So uh, if someone, this is the kind of orientalist discourse that I was talking about and how this game basically tries to combat that is by, again, referring to them as shinobi and showing realistic depictions. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Lakshmi? Yeah, okay. Uh, I uh, So I do have, uh, it's more than, like I said, uh, so I've done some work on uh, Japanese pop culture over my time. So if you don't mind uh, me giving you some feedback, criticism stuff. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, no, so, um, yeah, so one thing I do want to point out because you've mentioned this earlier in the uh, paper is about uh, Final Fantasy as an example of Western characters in Japanese stories. Uh, yes. Yeah, but that's not quite for reaching out to a Western audience. Um, mm-hmm. Because uh, so that, that's something that Japan has been doing for some time. And you might know this uh, from anime itself, right? Uh, if you've watched yes, anime, sure. you know that they have that whole idea of uh, Muko Kuseki, uh, like a non Japanese kind of description, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. you know, depictions of yeah. people. So to like a cultural orderless kind of, uh, you know, to yeah, like no, yeah, that's yeah, true. yeah. So, uh, so Final Fantasy is kind of an example of that. If you look at all uh, fifteen Final Fantasy games, you'll see that mm-hmm. uh, there are a lot of Japanese values, but. I think, yeah, each game has maybe one character who's actually kind of Japanese or has a mm-hmm. name which is vaguely Japanese, like uh, Yufei Kisaragi, for example, from Final Fantasy VII. Um, yeah, so that's uh, something that was interesting. What I did uh, think was uh, something that you could maybe um, incorporate as well when you're looking at this is that whole idea of, uh, you know, how much of this is Japan uh, creating uh, something that a Western audience would enjoy as a Japanese cultural artifact, uh, like, you know, uh, pre- presenting Japan to a Western audience, like how much of this is meant for that? Uh, like, you know, because I think a lot of uh, Japanese game companies have uh, mixed opinions about how to market a game uh, for the That's West. Right. Yeah, so uh, how much of it is reflective of like, this is the Japan that we want you to see? Uh, like, you know, look at our, uh, you know, cool ninja and uh, you know look at our uh, like again it's again very connected to what you are talking about this whole idea of uh, you know kind of uh, battling the the problematic depictions of uh, Japanese popular uh, Japanese culture uh, throughout western media but at the same time also presenting western uh, Japanese culture in a way that would be acceptable to a western audience uh, if you get what I'm saying does that make any sense 
Yeah, that does, but like maybe when you're talking about Final Fantasy or like I even t- take uh, the first Neo game, for example, there uh, it's historically accurate. The character William, that actually he actually exists in uh, the historical, you know, uh, uh, like whatever recountations of uh, Oda no- uh, Nobunaga's uh, period of conquest. That's an actual character. Mm-hmm. But uh, the main point is that how these characters, these non-Japanese characters, they become central to the story. They are the protagonists. So basically what happens is that that the story is told to their perspective and a Western audience can relate to them being non-Japanese. Hence, that's how they sometimes market these games. In Final Fantasy, as you said clearly, that there's this odorless uh, kind of uh, characterization. But that exa- ex- in itself might, you know... Uh, point out to the self-orientalism that's taking place in the Japanese thing where they've, you know, in like uh, con- these concepts, they have adopted them themselves. So that is the kind of discourse that I was talking about. How, despite their intentions, it comes across as that in, say, the Western context. Makes it, uh, makes the West, West more amiable to such, you know, accepting such characters, even if they are depict, uh, demonstrating very Japanese characteristics or Japanese ideals. The very fact that they are, uh, like, in appearance wise most toward uh, the western you know how the west, the west sees themselves that's that's what i mainly wanted to talk about uh, in this context okay great thanks uh, yeah and i also think it would appear uh, apply to uh, sekiro as well because i think they also have a very similar way of look at our awesome japanese past it's cool and not like wacky as you would imagine yeah <laughs> yeah that that's yeah basically the point <laughs> so does anyone else have any questions like feel free to ask any questions don't be shy like you can unmute yourself ask the question directly to jeffrey or if you don't have a mic or have some problem with your mic then you can simply type it in the comment section I see oh guys, Melvin. Do you have any questions? Uh, Melvin, do you have a question? I see that your mic is on. Maybe not. I think. Uh, do you, do, does anyone else have any questions? Then Again, can... I don't have a question, but I do have. Uh, I, I just Actually, want to say one more thing and then I I'll was shut really up. looking forward to this conversation between <laughs> Lakshmi and Jeffrey. I was really, really looking forward to this. Uh, uh, yeah, no, the thing is, I like I said, I'm like really obsessed with Japanese popular <laughs> culture. So, <laughs> which is why I. Uh, so, there's this. Uh, so, because this whole uh, game is set in the Sengoku period, I was just thinking about, again, like I said, mm-hmm. games that do not get. Uh, as popular in the West, but are extremely Japanese in uh, their uh, the way that the game works. And I'm thinking of this game series called uh, Sengoku Basara, uh, which is uh, Samurai Warriors, I think okay. was what the English uh, thing is. So it's based in the Sengoku period as mm-hmm. well, but it's a batshit insane game. Okay, so you have uh, it, like you have uh, all these characters that you would find like Nomuraga and Date Masamune and so on, but like mm-hmm. taken to eleven. Okay, so you have uh, people riding horses. Like, there's an anime based on it, so you could check out the anime if you want, and you'll get the idea of the aesthetic mm-hmm. of this okay. game series. But uh, it's like, um, I don't know if you're familiar with, um, uh, what was that game series called? A Dynasty Warriors, which is a uh, an earlier game. It's, it's, it's basically these games in which you, I can't remember the exact uh, title for that kind of a game, but basically you, have, you fight large masses of enemies using super-powered attacks. It's a very... Mm-hmm. Uh, I think kind of game. So it's very interesting to see how when, uh, you know, game, game devs want to present the Sengoku period to an international audience, they are very, like, they, they the kind of mechanics or the kind of aesthetics that they use are very different from what they would do for a game that is mostly targeted towards, uh, you know, mm-hmm. non-Western players. That's, that's one true. thing. And another thing uh, that, uh, like, based on what uh, Poonam said, that's, you know, your question about the whole Chinese-Japanese thing, I do have an opinion on that as well. <laughs> because, uh, have you guys heard of a game called Genshin Impact? Which is... Uh, all over the internet. I don't know if you guys are uh, familiar with Genshin Impact, I've but it's a Chinese game. I've heard of it, but never got a uh, chance to play yeah, it. So it's a, okay. it. Yeah, it's a Chinese game, but it's called Genshin Impact, which is a Japanese title. Uh, so what, what's happening is that the Chinese developers have 
willfully used a Japanese title to kind of lure fans of anime, and they've used a very anime style as well. So they want to lure fans of Japanese culture or Japanese uh, style um, art and stuff into uh, this, and you know, kind of hide the the veneer of Chineseness from it. So Genshin is really interesting uh, as an example of this weird kind of Orientalism, uh, or you know, this kind of like they want you to conflate the cultures kind of but once you play the game it's, it's a gacha game in which you, you know you uh, you spend money to get characters and they're all very pretty so you would want them you know for your waifus or husbandos or whatever <laughs> and yeah but genshin is a very interesting example of how they they willfully conflate uh, all these east asian cultures into one despite being an east asian uh, game dev so yeah i mean that's just uh, an opinion. Like I said, I have a lot to say. So anyway, uh, did I have a point at all? <laughs> I think I did say something. But yeah, so yeah, I did want you to check check out uh, Sengoku Basara for another example of uh, how you see a lot of samurai and ninja, and you know the like another example of how the Sengoku mm, period has been. Reflected. Most recently, I was uh, looking at Neo Two because that was a game I was playing, and ah. that is does an ex exceptionally good job of at least the historical aspects. It's the same way as Assassin's Creed, you know, put the magical in actual history and try to uh, make a fantasy history version. So that's what I was mm -hmm. looking at Neo too. So I uh, like, yeah, I can relate to what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I think you do have a question in the chat box now. <laughs> yes, you do. So Shovik sir logged in from another account. He's asking that he was wondering if you would see how you would see the portrayals of the period in RTS games like Total War Shogun 2 portrayal of the time period as in the Japanese time period in which Sekiro is set? Uh, well, first, I'll have to say that I am not familiar with these games. And second, uh, like, is this a like AAA title, basically? Or is it more like an indie game or something it's like a, that? It's a RTS game, actually. Total War Shogun 2. So, like, uh, my research mainly was on AAA games. I chose Sekiro as one of the examples because popularity is a very important factor in my research and Sekiro was dubbed as the game of the year 2019. So that does imply that it has a lot of uh, pop culture reach as well. And it's also present in memes like say, Get Good for example, or Shinobi Execution, or the whole infamous point where say, a game reviewer did use cheats to complete the game because it was so difficult and that brought up like a whole conversation of the ethics of gaming. So those uh, like th things like popularity was something that I was looking in my research. And as such, for that reason, perhaps maybe I've not come across this game. So like without knowing much about it, I might not be able to talk much about the game as per se, but if we talk about the portrayals of uh, that's such a period, I was just talking about Neo 2, right? Uh, Neo 2, while historically accu uh, not accurate, uh, the timeline wise, it tries to tell the story, but there are again the same kind of orientalist frameworks at play where uh, ninjutsu, for example, shows that these characters can breathe fire, use water, lightning, these kind of elements. Oh, it's a, it is a AAA title. Uh, then that would be something that I would have to look into. Like I would not be able to say much about it right now because I've not gone through it. But in general, uh, like for most AAA titles that again are marketed to the West, this is what has been the framework at play usually. Uh, using the pop cultural myths, in, incorporate that into actual stories to kind of uh, uh, portray them to a Western market. That's what I've seen so far. Thank you, Shavik, sir, for the question. So does anyone else have any question or like anything in general you want to say about the talk or Sekiro or Japanese culture in general? So I guess if nobody has any question, I think we can wrap up the talk then. Like if it's all right with you, Jeffrey. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the questions, and thank you for being here. I All right, thank talk. you, Jeffrey. That was a wonderful talk. We got to learn a lot about Japanese culture in general. Like most people, as you said, thought that ninjas were like super secret assassins dressed in black and everything with knife and hidden blades. But yeah, you shed some light into 
the whole ninja factor that yes they were actually rather spies disguised as a normal spy would and they weren't total assassins dressed in black who would just stab you in the face at night they weren't mm -hmm. that so thank you for shedding light into that i mean even i didn't know to be honest even i thought that ninjas were like secret assassins i had no idea that yeah. they were yeah. basically like spies like assassins creed <laughs> so i guess we'll call it a day and make sure to visit our facebook page if you want to attend more talks podcasts and our signature adda sessions and if 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 someone can share the whatsapp link here real quick before we head out that would be very nice yeah i cannot i uh, my screen is recording so i cannot minimize uh, so with that right, yeah uh, or rico I'll, yeah yeah i'll do it yeah. uh, just give me a few moments because i see a few new new members and in case you guys uh, yes we do us. yes i am seeing an influx of new members today so guys if you want to stay updated about our future talks please feel free to join our facebook please feel free to like our facebook page because we always post our meeting links there and obviously like for our podcast we share the youtube link on our facebook page and yeah speaking of youtube you can also find our youtube channel its title gsi what game studies india adda game studies india adda so just go to youtube search for the channel game studies india adda we upload our talks podcast and adda sessions in the youtube channel so yep that's that okay so i see that the whatsapp chat group yeah. link is posted in yeah. the zoom chat so guys if you are watching the chat right now there's the link of the whatsapp group and the link of the facebook group in the chat so feel free to hit the like button in our facebook page and join our whatsapp group because we generally have time to time awesome conversations in our whatsapp group and yeah we are a friendly bunch of people <laughs> interested about video gaming all right then bye bye guys Bye okay, bye, 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 guys. Thanks for joining, and thank you, thank Jeffrey, you, for the wonderful thank talk. You, thank you, thank you, Rico, uh, for, for moderating. Thank you, Rico. This yeah. Great yep, session. You're most welcome. It's my pleasure. <laughs> so, bye, bye, guys. See you in the next talk. Yes. Bye, bye. Okay. Bye, bye.